everyone. Welcome to our meet and greet call with Rachel Carestis, CCL's new executive director. I'm Flannery Winchester. I'm CCL's senior director of communications, and I will be your host this evening. So tonight, um, we are going to do three things. Of course, we'll do what we're all here to do, which is meet Rachel Carestis, CCL's new executive director. We will share with her some stories uh, from you, the volunteers, and your insights into this work, because a meet and greet goes both ways. We want to introduce ourselves to. Um, and then we'll have time for Q&A with Rachel herself. So our agenda tonight is about 45 minutes. So first, I want to share a little bit about who is on the call tonight. So um, many of you saw that we created a Google form for volunteers to share your perspective and your stories with Rachel. Um, hundreds of you from every CCL region took the time to share your stories and questions. So thank you for that. Um, and I was blown away by the, the passion, the thoughtfulness, the dedication, the commitment that shined through those answers. Um, those of us who have been on staff for a while know just what a unique and incredible bunch of volunteers are in CCL. Um, but it was beautiful to see it collected there. And, uh, and I'm excited to share some of it back with you and uh, with Rachel tonight. So Rachel, we asked people, what motivates them to do this work? And here's what they said. 40% of respondents in our forum said they're motivated by their children, their grandchildren, or future generations in general. So many people said some form of that. Um, I actually thought one parent really painted a picture when they said, I've always cared, but I wasn't actively working on it till my middle school daughter was in tears one day about whether the earth would be livable when she's an adult, both to demonstrate the power of action and that I took her concerns seriously. I took to my computer to find a locally active, lobbying-focused environmental group. I found CCL and signed up online. 24% um, of people said they're motivated by the science or the impacts they're already seeing. So people were mentioning things like extreme heat, melting glaciers, warmer winters, wildfires, people being displaced, um, and things like that. And then uh, have to give a shout out to the 5% of people who specifically said they are motivated by carbon pricing. Uh, to those folks, I say, you're in the right spot. We obviously, we work on a whole suite of policies now, but we remain very committed to advocating for that incredibly powerful policy. Um, and I thought this uh, one volunteer captured their motivation really beautifully. Um, they said they're motivated by the possibility of building a better world than the one we have right now. A world where people have access to abundant clean energy and a world where everyday Americans know that together we can solve any challenge put in front of us. So <clears throat> just a couple of other answers that came up were um, people saying they're motivated by their faith or by protecting nature. And I wanted to mention that several of you said you're motivated by the feeling that no one else is doing what needs to be done and you want to be the ones to step up and address the problem. Uh, and this is just perfectly in the spirit of CCL's founder, Marshall Saunders. He told us over a decade ago, when you get in a dire situation, the cavalry shows up, right? Well, I think, I'm sure of it, we are the cavalry. So Rachel, that's who you're talking to tonight. Uh, and that's the grassroots army that you're leading now. Um, and so now we're gonna hear briefly from our former executive director, Mark Reynolds, who has uh, led us in this work for so many years. Mark? Boy, fine, right. Sorry, I did not expect to get kind of caught off guard by that. Sorry, so, I love to get choked up here. I know, yeah. I know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so in June of 23, the board started a process of hiring, recruiting and hiring a new director. Over, well over 400 people applied. And I could understand that because who wouldn't be, want to be part of this grassroots army, as Marshall called it, a peaceful grassroots army who treats people with gratitude and gets build, big climate bills passed. Uh, and particularly in a bipartisan way. The most recent, the uh, uh, Advantage, Advance Act was passed on an 88 to two basis, which in my view is a pretty bipartisan basis. Uh, I wanna thank the two board chairs uh, and all of the whole CCL board of directors for their work. But in particular, I wanna thank Princella Talley, Alex Bosmoski, Scott Lechman, Mary Selkirk and Ernie Chow. That's the group of five people who met every week since last June. If they were on vacation, they met. If it was a holiday, they met to, to work, get us through this process. So they started with over 400 applicants. They got it down to 11. Then they got it down to three. And they made what I believe is the perfect choice. 
So I had on my list two things. One is I wanted somebody who had former ED experience because it's a different kind of job. When you're at the end of the line on everything, it's a different kind of pressure. And, and I personally thought it would be good to have someone who'd felt that kind of pressure before. Second, somebody who had fundraising experience. Uh, because in a nonprofit, that is always on your mind and someone who had that experience. So Rachel checked those box. So I was super excited about that. But then, wow, we found out that she'd already worked on bipartisan climate legislation. How cool is that? Had extensive media experience and then bonus had a science background. So I don't think we could have come up with a more perfect person. And I'm absolutely thrilled that Rachel is our new executive director. And Flannery, I'll hand it back to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark. I'll say I'm seeing lots of love for you in the chat to me. Someone said, um, thanked you for your all your work and said you and CCL have made a big difference in my advocacy in my life. So um, thank you, Mark. All right, so without further ado, let's meet Rachel. Rachel, can you um, say hi and tell us how it's been going your first few days on the job? Yeah, well, hi everyone. And, and first, thank you, Mark, for those very kind words and, Thank you so much for all of your service to this organization uh, over all these years and for, for helping to build this tremendous army that um, Marshall was referring to. So I'm speaking for everybody, but thank you for all of that. Um, and so, hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. I think um, it's been a little bit of a onboarding process for me the last few days. I've spent a lot of time on Zoom trying to get to meet all the members of the team, uh, do one-on-one -on -one conversations with the board. But this was really, don't tell anybody, but this was really the conversation that I was looking most forward to because you guys are the life and soul of CCL. And I'm so impressed by all the work that you all have done over the years. And I'm just really looking forward to getting to know you, learning more and to answering whatever questions you may have for me tonight. But this is the first of many conversations. So thank Thank you all for being here tonight. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Rachel. So folks, you can um, start putting your questions for Rachel in the Q&A at any time uh, through the call this evening, uh, and we'll get to the Q&A section with her in just a few minutes. Um, so first, Rachel, we're going to share with you some of the stories and reflections that the volunteers shared ahead of time. Um, so one of the questions that we asked volunteers was, what parts of your CCL work are you most proud of? Um, and so everyone who's here live on the call tonight, you're welcome to put your own answers to this question in the chat to me, uh, and I'll also read a few out loud. But there were a few big themes that jumped out from how folks answered this question ahead of time. So the first was that uh, volunteers are incredibly proud of the progress we're making with Congress and the way we're making that progress, which is by reaching across our divides and building common ground. So let's take a look at, at what some folks uh, specifically said. So one volunteer said they were proud that their lobby team got a congressman to co-sponsor a bill. Uh, there really is nothing quite like that moment when your lobbying ask really lands. Such a great feeling. Uh, one volunteer was proud that they had brought in a diverse group to a lobby meeting. They had brought in high school students, members of a local Latino action group, and a local bicycle group. And their member of Congress said to them, I see you've broadened your coalition. And that tipped him over into supporting the Energy Innovation Act. Very cool story. Um, other volunteers mentioned their pride in building relationships with members of Congress, even when that relationship presents challenges. Uh, and they said how it's inspiring to see the change in our conversations over time. And we also see that progress with Congress in the comments that Congress makes about us. So one volunteer was proud of their member calling CCL a force to be reckoned with in a public interview that they gave. And another tells the story of sending an article over to their contact in the congressional office and the staffer saying back, we haven't met in a while, would you like to come in? And that type of relationship with the office and in general, the reputation our volunteers have built on Capitol Hill is really something to be proud of. Um, quite a few people also mentioned being proud of their CCL work because of how we really do this work with open arms. So people mentioned the friendships I've built with the kinds of people I would normally not talk to and how CCL is open and inclusive to all walks of life and political views. I saw several comments <clears throat> where people acknowledged how tough it can be to actually live out that nonpartisan value and um, stay grounded in that respect and appreciation that we always try to bring to the table, but that doing those things makes the work 
especially worthwhile. Um, okay, so now let me take um, take a look at what you've been chatting about what you're proud of. Let me see what we've got. Um, Bobby says, our team has had high school age young people in person at lobby meetings. We see how powerful that is for the member of Congress. Luke says, I'm most proud of bringing in new volunteers and helping them grow their engagement. Absolutely. Um, I'm seeing some questions. So be sure you're putting your questions in the Q&A. Um, I see Doug is proud of uniform respect for all we, for all that we meet with. Um, Mary says, growing from a person who would never talk with a legislator to a lobby team leader who went to DC twice. Oh, super cool. Okay. Um, so now we're going to watch a short video that was submitted from Nadine, one of our volunteers in New Jersey, and her story really encapsulates some of these ideas of progress with Congress and bridging Hi. divides. I'm Nadine Safferman, a longtime CCO group leader from central New Jersey. In 2009, my then member of Congress went out on a limb as a Republican by supporting cap and trade. The bill failed in Congress, and this MOC took a lot of heat for supporting it. He felt like it was a bad political move on his part, and he reminded us of this at virtually every time we met with him. CCL started meeting with his office in 2013. Relations were cordial, but cool. When we met with his office explaining the concept of carbon fee and dividend, there was no legislation back then. He or his, or his staff often came back with questions about how people in the district would be affected by the policy. How would it affect people with low incomes? We sent the household impact study. How would it impact jobs? We shared the Remy study. Each step along the way, we kept meeting and listening and building relationships. In November of 2015, a group of five high school students in our chapter organized a meeting with this representative in district. This was a game changer. The representative was so impressed by these students. He listened to their concerns about how climate change will affect their future. At the end of the meeting, he told them, you are on the right side of history. This was a turning point in our relationship with the congressman and his office. Chapter members continued to write and call his office regularly. We secured grass tops endorsements from dozens of community leaders. We wrote letters to the editor and attended town hall meetings to let him know his constituents care about climate change. The following year, our big ask, was for him to join the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus. We met with his office in June for CCL's Lobby Day, where we discussed who he might join with, as there needed to be one member of Congress from each party at the time to join the caucus. He was noncommittal, but we were hopeful. Within a month, he had joined the caucus, and he and his staff regularly participated in the caucus sessions and actions. This story shows the value of listening, meeting with members of Congress where they are, building relationship, and most importantly, in my opinion, the power of youth in influencing our members of Congress. Um, incredible story. Thank you, Nadine, for sending that in. Um, and I've seen a few more shares come through in the chat. Um, let me just read a few more. So um, Carol is proud of offering hope to young people through our CCL work. Andrea is proud of being an action team leader and getting the word out to my communities. And Amy says, I am proud to be part of an organization that really lives its values. I have become a better person because of CCL. All right, so I think that we could probably do that all night. Um, <laughs> so I'm gonna move on uh, for the sake of time, but, um, I'll share one more big theme that I noticed from the submissions, and then we will get to Q&A with Rachel. So keep putting your questions in and uploading ones that you see other folks have asked that you definitely want us to get to. Um, so this was the other thing that you all seem to be so proud of when you think about your CCL work, which is the ways that you have grown as individuals and helped your chapters grow over the years. 
So folks said they were proud of the roles they've taken on. They mentioned stepping out of my comfort zone to become a chapter leader and becoming a state coordinator, which they never could have imagined when they first joined. Um, and this, this last comment here on the bottom uh, jumped out to me too as an important one. This person was proud that even though they don't always have time to do a lot, they manage to contribute and make their chapter better and more effective with the time that they do have. That's huge because we all have busy lives and other responsibilities, but to keep showing up in the ways that we can is absolutely something to be proud of. So on this personal growth note, uh, we have another video submission from one of our longtime liaisons who, uh, whose CCL work brought him somewhere he certainly never expected, which was to the State of the Union address. So Brent, can you show us that video? Hi, I'm Mike Kelly from Bainbridge Island, Washington. I'm a group leader and a co-state coordinator in Washington State. But for about eight years, I was the liaison to Representative Derek Kilmer. I was surprised to get a call from him in December of 2019, asking me to be his guest at the State of the Union in February 2020. Since past guests were the superintendent of Olympic National Park, which is in his district, and the president of the Washington State Building and Construction Trades Council, to say the least, I was pretty honored to be invited. I uh, had a great time meeting other members of Congress with Representative Kilmer at the receptions held before the State of the Union and to sit in the House chamber to hear President Trump's last State of the Union right before COVID ex uh, exploded. And, March of 2020. We made a video together, which Representative Kilmer shared on social media. Hey everybody, Derek Kilmer here from our nation's capital. It's State of the Union evening. Uh, and every year I get to invite one guest. My guest uh, today is Mike Kelly. I've gotten to know, uh, know Mike because he's involved with a group called Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, Mike, talk about how you got involved uh, in this effort and why climate change matters to you. Oh, great. Thanks a lot. And thank you so much, Congressman, for inviting me. I really was just so thrilled and pleased when I got the call to, to come and, and surprised. Uh, I've been involved in the environmental movement for probably 35 years, 40 years, ever since I was in college. Uh, and I have to say that Citizens Climate Lobby, which is the group that I've been involved with for about six years now, so effective is that they really are explicitly bipartisan. And environmentalism traditionally has been a bipartisan uh, pro proposal in the United States. It hasn't really been one party or the other. And so I like CCL's uh, approach there. And they're also very, very effective. They emphasize volunteers at the local level across the country, working with their congressmen and senators, as we do with Representative Kilmer, uh, to just talk about where the crisis is and what the opportunity for, for, uh, for improving it is and for addressing it through legislation. And we're really pleased that Congressman Kilmer has decided uh, to join 76 other members of the House in, in co-sponsoring the legislation to try to put a price on carbon as best way of addressing uh, the climate change problem. Yeah, and you know, um, I, I mentioned I invited Mike in part to elevate an issue that I hope gets some attention uh, in the present State of the Union. Um, my hope is that you'll see Democrats and Republicans in this town start to um, uh, take some action and make some progress on behalf of the American people. So, Mike Kelly, my guest at the State of the Union, thank you for watching, uh, and uh, I guess uh, enjoy the evening. Thank you. Such a great story. So you never know where being a CCL volunteer will take you. Um, all right, so lastly, one other idea, um, that came through was this idea of chapter growth. So um, you guys talked about helping other volunteers um, step into their power and grow and support each other in this difficult work. And uh, I love this story about growth in one chapter. Um, a volunteer shows up and complains slash criticizes slash someone ought to for two years. I do my best to listen to them and appreciate them. One day they start taking ownership of activities in the chapter. Soon they are leading. Now I find myself discovering things they've done, ways they've led other volunteers that I didn't even know were happening. Just incredible. So our last video submission is from Alex in Chicago. Um, he takes a moment to reflect on his own chapter's growth uh, and his role in that, and to wish uh, you well, Rachel, as you set out on your own journey with us here at CCL. In October of 2023, the Chicago chapter hosted an event at Northerly Island which is a part of the Chicago Parks District and is on an artificial island in Lake Michigan that's quite near downtown. We had roughly 30 people there, half of whom had never heard of CCL before. They just found the event online. And 
Uh, at one point, I took a break on like kind of a high hill overlooking all these volunteers who were doing various uh, you know, land stewardship activities uh, against this backdrop of the Chicago skyline. And it made me think about when I very first joined the Chicago chapter leadership team in the summer of 2020. Before the pandemic, the Chicago chapter had been a robust chapter, um, but in the months since the pandemic had started, basically our monthly meetings were down to like four or five people all sitting on Zoom, staring at each other like, what the hell do we do now? Um, and now we're this powerful chapter again. We do these kinds of events all the time, literally one just yesterday. Um, and we brought nine people to uh, the summer conference in D.C. Uh, just earlier this month. Looking back, I can't really think of any kind of breakthrough moment or any secret to our success. Um, but really, we've just kept enjoying ourselves. We've kept leaving room for other people to enjoy themselves, and we've continued to stay true to who we are as people and to who we are uh, as an organization, as, as CCL. In the future, I hope you're able to look back uh, at this time now when you're first joining CCL and you're able to look back with a sense of pride and wonder over what we have accomplished together. Wonderful. All right. So thanks, Alex, for sending in that message. Um, and thank you again to everyone who shared your stories, your memories, your perspectives on your CCL work um, to help give Rachel a sense of what an amazing project she is here to lead. Okay, let's get into our Q&A time with Rachel. So we have pulled together a bunch of your questions submitted ahead of time, um, but then we'll also take some of the questions from you here live on the call tonight. So I'm keeping an eye on the Q&A. Um, feel free to keep putting questions there. Um, so, hi, Rachel. Hi. Um, we are going to get started with our, this was actually our first prepared question, and it is one of the top uh, upvoted questions. So we had, uh, we have lots of curiosity about your goals and your priorities as you begin to lead CCL. So, of course, it's early days, um, but what can you tell us about your focus as you get started? Sure, thank you, Flannery, and I'm excited for this part of the conversation. Um, I think, you know, as I come into this new, my focus is going to really be on making sure that the staff and volunteers have everything you need to do to be able to work as efficiently and effectively as possible, because we want to give you all of the tools and empowerment so that you can really get out there and make the change that we all want to see. So. To me, what that looks like is probably two things, I think, to start. So, you know, first, building, as Mark alluded to actually earlier, like building even more connections with foundations and donors who are excited about our work so that we can continue to grow and sustain what we're doing well into the future. And then I think the second thing is also helping to provide some strategic clarity so that we know we have all this muscle, we have all this capability, how best can we direct all of those resources and spend our time to make the most impact? I think that's where I'm going to be spending time uh, in these you know, first couple of months. And I think there's so much amazing stuff about this organization and there's so much uniqueness in there and so much that works really well. Um, and so I also know that like no one's perfect, I'm not perfect. So I'm also hoping that there's ways that maybe I can find things in my background and experience that can help grow and strengthen what you guys already do so well so that we can continue to see the change that we've all been working for um, in the time ahead. Absolutely. Um, so that's a great uh, segue actually into one of our next questions that folks are curious about, which is, um, how do you envision applying your previous experience to advance CCL's work and our mission? Yeah, well, you know, one of the things I think that really connected me to the organization and to the work that, that you all have been doing for the last several years is that bipartisan theme. Um, the positiveness, the optimism, the thoughtfulness, those are all ways that I've approached public policy in the past, but bipartisan has all, always been a through line for me. And that means different things to different people. So let me tell you what that means to me, because I think that's important. You know, over the course of my career, 
I've engaged in a whole bunch of different bipartisan campaigns on like really big policy issues and also on things that are kind of more insider type of, of work. And sometimes that means you know, it's a Republican-led proposal, and we need to persuade Democrats to join us. And that means, you know, maybe it's like 70% Republican, 30% Democrat. Sometimes it's been Democrats leading, and we need to persuade Republicans to join us. And again, it's, you know, maybe the ultimate policy proposals come more from the Democratic side than the Republican side. And every once in a while, although I could really only think of one really good example of this, where the policy really was kind of like 50-50, you know, where it really relied on sort of equal amounts of Democratic and Republican um, support. And so I guess what I was saying earlier about finding ways to strategically direct our resource is looking for those ways where we can have bipartisan impact, because regardless of, of what the composition of that is, those are always really meaningful, impactful policy changes, looking for those, and then looking for the ways that we can leverage what CCL does best to get to those bipartisan wins on things that we know are going to make a difference for climate. Totally. Makes sense. Well, so I'm going to go to uh, one of our questions live from folks on the call tonight. Um, that is, a, I think, a nice follow-up to this uh, that topic. Mike is asking, which of your strengths are you most excited about bringing to CCL? So talked a little bit about the work, maybe you personally, um, what's one of your strengths you're excited to bring to the table? Well, I don't know if it's a strength, um, but I've been passionate about this work since I was a kid before I could even articulate what it was. Like I've always been really interested in the natural world. I have an undergraduate degree in biology. I've always been studying things and asking questions, you know, why this, why that? And I've always been acutely aware of what's happening in the environment. And even before we really found the words to describe climate change, it was something that I was keeping tabs on. And it's where I spent a lot of my own volunteer time and hours um, more on a local level. And so I'm not sure that's a strength, but it's a passion of mine. And I think that's one of the things that, that has me really excited about this work is to get to take everything I've learned in all sorts of other policy areas and topics and be able to help apply it to something that I also am super personally passionate about. Love it. Um, okay, we have a question from Lisa on the call who's asking, what do you see as challenges to communicating the urgency of climate change to the general population? Um, and she also asks, how do you think CCL can get more of those people interested uh, in sharing their views with elected officials? Yeah, that's a big question, right? Yeah. And so I, I'd actually break that break that down a little bit because when we talk about the general population, that's a little bit of a misnomer because really there's so many segments to that population and to those audiences and all of them need to hear different things from us to feel the sense of urgency and to be motivated to move forward and act. So I think the answer to that question is also sort of coming back to that strategic directioning. Who is it that we need to persuade and why? And then how do we meet them where they are and bring them along on the, the journey with us? Absolutely. Okay, so we are, um, our next most upvoted question uh, is most upvoted by double the one behind it. So people are very curious about this one. Um, they're wondering about the upcoming election. So, uh, and just for a little context, I'll say, you know, CCL, of course, we've been working on mobilizing environmental voters. So we make sure that the, the perspective of people who care about this issue is reflected at the polls. Um, we've also been working to push every candidate for office at every level so that those candidates have stronger climate platforms. Um, but it's no secret that every, not every elected official is where we would hope they would be on the climate issue. Um, so I wonder if you can speak to sort of the idea of, of how can we stay motivated is the is the top question 
um, but also a little bit of how you know an organization prepares for big changes like that that are really out of our control. Um, you know, we can influence, but we can't solely you know affect the outcome ourselves. Um, and so, if you want to talk maybe a little bit about scenario planning or or plans that might be in the works to just prepare for either outcome. Yeah, well, I think one of the keys when any election comes up, and we've we have we've experienced a number of elections over the last several cycles that have been big swings, you know, and that has has created a lot of turmoil in the system and for groups like ours. You know, what it comes down to is remembering who we are and remembering our mission, our vision, our focus, why we exist, why we all do this, this work. I believe firmly and passionately that we can work with anyone. We can work with anyone. This organization has a great track record of working with anyone and for finding ways to get to wins regardless of who's in control of what, right? Whether it be the White House, Congress, even in state and local governments, which I know is not our focus, but it, if we're focused on who we are, what we do and why it matters, that's what keeps us motivated, right? That's we're, our commitment to the mission and our passion for the work. And then we find a way to get things done. Um, and so to your point, Flannery, you know, even in, it's been exactly five days, so I don't know if I can count that as a week or not um, for me, but we've already started to have these conversations, like what are the various scenarios we may see post-election? What's everything that is possible, whether it's probable or not, and how would we prepare for that because preparation is is everything at the end of the day but i think the other thing in that preparation is the optimism that we have something to do no matter what happens in this election and we do we do it's not time to it's not no matter what happens it's not time to rest on our laurels awesome couldn't agree more um Okay, well, so I'm going to turn back to our list of prepared questions, um, and this one's a little lighter. So one volunteer in the forum asked, how can we redress the internal imbalance between nerds and people people? Um, I thought that was a great question, because it's true that CCL has, has historically uh, skewed pretty nerdy as a group. <laughs> so what do you think about that? I love that. I love that. Um, well, first of all, nerds are people, so um, they're not people, people, people. Um, I don't know that I would describe myself as a nerd. I've always called myself a wonk. Um, my master's degree is in public policy, so I'm much more of a wonk than a nerd, but I think we get to, there's some Venn diagram in there where we overlap. Um, look, it, it kind of goes back to what I was saying before about the, the general population and what we need to do to be effective and to persuade folks is to meet them where they are, right? So it's really about understanding who our audience is, what they need, and how we can persuade them. And I think this is one of the hangups, though, and I can say this as a, as a wonk, but I suspect this is probably true for nerds. Um, this is very interesting terminology, by the way. Um, but I think, um, you know, when we spend a lot of time in the jargon or in the weeds or explaining details of things, then we're not persuading. And we always want to focus on persuading others and finding the, the you know, lucent and salient talking points that persuade them, right? That's not about being slick or clever or, you know, any of that sort of stuff, but it's understanding, thinking back to that earlier slide you had, Flannery, of like why people are doing this work. Well, 40% of the group is saying, well, I'm here because I'm concerned about the future for my children or my grandchildren or future generations. Well, let's start our conversation there. Tell me about your concerns. Tell me about what you'd like to see. And that changes the dynamic, right? So it's it's not about dumbing things down, but it's about meeting people where they are and finding ways to connect with them, which I think everyone here is actually really good at. Um, so give yourself some credit. 
All right. Um, we also have quite a few comments in the form referencing carbon pricing. So we had questions, we had people mentioning it as their motivation, we had stories around particular bills. Um, but one specific question asked, will carbon pricing play a role in CCL's future strategy? Well, great. I'd be surprised if this question wasn't in there, <laughs> um, given everything I know about CCL up, up to this point. So it's obviously, carbon pricing has obviously been really important to CCL's work from the beginning, and it's going to continue to be important um, to our work. And I think it really embodies so many of the organization's value, right? It, it It's a policy that appeals to both sides of the aisle. It's a bipartisan thing, which is completely and totally vital. Um, it also really aims high. And it also suggests that this is a problem that can be solved, right? And those things coming together really exemplify the, the thoughtfulness and the optimism that's really so core to CCL. So anyway, that was a long way of saying that, yes, absolutely, carbon pricing will play an important role in our strategy moving forward. Awesome. Um, okay, one volunteer in the forum uh, took a, a hard left turn away from policy questions and specific CCL questions, and they just asked, are you a dog or a cat person? <laughs> so uh, maybe tell us a little bit about your uh, your pets and your family. Uh, so you think that's a that's a softball question? Actually, um, it's a somewhat controversial question in our household right now. I'll be honest. Um, we we have a cat currently. Um, I have an eight year old who very much wants a dog, and it hasn't been clear because my husband was in the Navy and we moved around a lot. It wasn't really as practical to consider that. But now that my husband's retired, his lobbying campaign, my son's lobbying campaign for a dog has begun in earnest. And um, he's not uh, he's not listening to this this evening because I think he he thinks that maybe he can tap into some of the expertise here to develop an effective lobbying campaign. I'm sure he'll be watching this video and other things on the learning community later to figure out how to um, how to get a dog in our house. So uh, officially neutral on that for now. Love it. Love it. Well, persistence is half the battle with lobbying, good lobbying. So he's, he's going to keep after you, I'm sure. Too yeah. funny. Um, okay, well, um, we are almost out of time. So I think uh, I'll just pose sort of a, an open last question to you. Is there anything else that you'd like to share or say to the volunteers um, on the call tonight or watching the recording later? Well, I just want to thank everybody who came tonight and thank you for, for such a warm welcome. Um, it's really been just tremendous, all of the messages and and all of the, the things that you all have sent forward. It's clear just to how much this organization means to you and how important this mission is. And um, I hope that I'm able to, you know, build your trust and, and confidence. And I really look forward to working with all of you and getting to know as much of you, as many of you as I can over the time ahead. So thank you all for being here and to be continued, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you again, Rachel, for uh, for all those great answers and insights. Uh, it's wonderful to hear from you. And uh, I know everybody appreciated the, the time this evening. Um, so to wrap up tonight, uh, one other question that we asked volunteers ahead of time was, what do you think is important? it's important for Rachel to know as the new executive director of CCL? Um, so Rachel, here are some of the things that people wanted you to know. One volunteer said, I came for the policy. I stayed for the people. To stay, I need only the people, but to stay excited, I need both. Another volunteer emphasized our sense of community as being one important key to our success. And another made the distinction that climate is what we fight for, but organizing is what we do. Um, and this comment jumped out at me. Many of us feel stuck in place. I can understand feeling that way if you've been at this for a long time and you know we've definitely seen progress, but still not at the speed and the scale we really need for climate change to be fixed. Um, so they say we need someone's vision and goals to help us recharge our passion. And a few more gems, uh, someone wanted you to know, CCL volunteers always strive to do what's right. We're curious and we want to grow as people and we overcome our greatest fears by putting trust in our democracy and in each other. And we do it all on our own time and our own dime. Um, I need to figure out who submitted some of these things and ask them if they want to help, you know, 
just be an honorary member of the marketing and comms team. People are so eloquent. Um, in a similar vein, someone said uh, they wanted you to know that you'll be working with the most wonderful, thoughtful, committed, determined, collaborative people you'll ever know. And of course, there were some well wishes for you specifically. One volunteer said, we want you to be super successful uh, and help us save the world. So no pressure. <laughs> um, and last but not least, uh, we asked people to describe CCL in one word. Um, Y'all know we love a word cloud. So the big ideas that emerged are that CCL is empowering, optimistic, impactful, respectful, persistent, passionate, the list goes on. Um, so I think I say, uh, I speak for all of us when I say once more, welcome aboard, Rachel. We hope you feel all of these qualities firsthand as you get further into your role. Um, we're so excited to have you and we know that you'll love this organization and this work just as much as we do. So let's go make some incredible things happen together. And that's all we have. Uh, that's all we have for you tonight. So thanks again, Rachel. And thanks for everyone for joining the call. We'll see you on July 13th for our normal monthly meeting. All right. Have a great night. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. Like what you hear? Recommend us to your friends and make sure to give us a five-star rating. It helps us show up on other listeners' feeds. Feel free to pass on any suggestions for future episodes in the comments as well. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.